All right, um, I'd like to go ahead and welcome our next speaker, Heidi Sasek, as you all know and love here. Um, <laughs> she'll be, yes, you love, love me. <laughs> uh, she'll be speaking about community structure and ecosystem dynamics on the Northeast U.S. shelf. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, I have to lead right off with a disclaimer that this title is very much aspirational, with an A. Uh, we've really just gotten started with a plan moving forward towards this goal, so keep your expectations in line. As Dave Garrison mentioned on Monday, NSF is now funding two new ocean sites as part of the US LTER network, and the Northeast US Shelf is one of those. Our site formally started as part of the network in uh, last September, but the story begins much earlier, and the organizers of the session asked me to reflect a little bit on how the stage was set for this region to now be joining the LTER network. So briefly, our approach for the project reflects a range of scales and observation priorities. Our primary observational focus is a, a cross-shelf transect that's highlighted in yellow here. It extends from Martha's Vineyard southward to the edge of the shelf. Uh, to provide a regional context for this transect, we're taking advantage of NOAA's quarterly ecosystem monitoring surveys that extend from Cape Hatteras northward through the Gulf of Maine. And we also have high frequency observations that we get by leveraging two existing ocean observatories along the cross shelf transect, the cabled MBCO site that's on the near shore end and the OOI Pioneer Array at the shelf break. So this is a wide, shelf in a dynamic temperate zone. There are many processes that help set up large temperature gradients, as you see in this summertime SST image. There are a variety of really valuable historical data sets for the region, including things like the Woods Hole temperature record that extends back to the late 1800s uh, and shows things like a strong warming trend since at least the 1960s. Uh, in more recent years, observatory records like those at MBCO are providing extremely detailed characterization of things like seasonality, where you see a uh, more than 20 degree temperature range each year. We also have an uh, observational numerical modeling work of our co-PI Chang Sheng Chen. Um, this provides us a framework not only to integrate forcing data sets, but also to integrate across space and time scales. And uh, Chen is using a nesting approach from global down to high resolution um, in, at the regional scale. So our framework considers the ways that various physical processes interact to impact things like nutrient inputs and ultimately productivity across the shelf. We're focusing on understanding the processes that lead to changes in community and food web structure in the plankton but also how those in turn impact fish and other higher trophic levels. We expect strong signals in this system at seasonal to interannual scales that will help us to understand why things are changing and ultimately how the mechanisms that we uncover might help us project to impacts at longer time scales. So how did the stage get set for us to launch this project? Uh, there are many threads to that. I'm going to jump into this by highlighting a very personal perspective. Why am I standing up here giving this talk today? And a pivotal part of that story dates back to the early 2000s and is intertwined with a technology development path. We had been working for several years to design and build our first uh, automated submersible flow cytometer uh, for measuring plank plankton, flow cytobot. At this point, we were past the stage of proving that the technology could work, and we were looking for ways to begin collecting um, interesting data sets. The, at the same time, the Martha's Vineyard Coastal Observatory was just getting off the ground and was a good fit. Uh, we managed some early deployments of this technology in uh, 2003. These are just examples of the data from that work cell concentration of Sinecococcus, the dominant picoplankter um, in this ecosystem. And these data have hourly resolution, as you can see, for several months. We were totally blown away, thrilled. Everything was a great success with the deployments. This was way more Sinecococcus data than we'd ever had with unprecedented resolution. So we were very excited, but like many new data sets, as soon as we had this, we had new questions and we wanted more, a little more data, we always want. 
Um, and apparently, uh, that's a long story, but a little more wasn't enough because somehow deployment after deployment, here we are today with this time series, the 2003 date is that little slice back at the beginning and we're running right up through today. I don't know what this looks like to you, but it still takes my breath away. I, uh, you can ask me later how I feel about this time series. Uh, some of you have heard me refer to it as something that sounds like my fourth child. Um, literally, a whole PhD thesis has been written on this and more can be said, but I'm gonna go on because time is passing by in the talk and I'm still back in the early 2000s when we uh, begin working in these coastal waters and we quickly realized, of course, that we were missing a lot by focusing on traditional flow cytometry that's really optimized for assessing the smallest phytoplankton. So a few years later, we brought um, Flow Cytobot's new age cousin on the scene, imaging Flow Cytobot. This instrument rapidly images particles in flow and produces pictures like these examples, a very few examples from the data collected at MDCO, which now is literally hundreds of millions of images. So going forward from 2006, we started deploying the imaging instruments side by side with the original Flow Cytobot. And we're now able to produce time series such as these. I'm just highlighting the abundance of two interesting diatom species, species in the system where with the combination of the automated observations, automated processing and machine learning algorithms, we can resolve many types of microplankton to genus or species. So obviously these are very powerful uh, kinds of data sets for us to be looking at ecological changes at the base of the food web. Um, but notably, we can do more with these data than just count cells. Um, we can also produce things like size and biomass budgets. For the small cells, um, we determine the cell volume of each individual based on how much light it scatters when it goes through the laser beam. And we can then compute biomass for a population or a assemblage by adding up the contributions of each of the measured cells. When we look at microplankton, light scattering is really tricky to interpret because of their complex shape and their size range. But here we can turn to the details that we have in the images. And again, with the right algorithms, we can estimate the size, the biovolume in three dimensions of each cell and then add its contribution to our biomass budgets along with the the small cells that we estimate from the laser scattering. We can now consider a variety of levels of detail in these budgets from individual taxa. These, this is just a time series of the dominant picoplankton and the dominant species of chain forming diatom. You see, interestingly, they're out of phase seasonally, but they have about the same biomass. It's really, this is carbon now. I've made a carbon estimate from, from the individual cell measurements. Um, we can also now aggregate at, the, at whatever taxonomic level we're interested in. So these are the seasonal climatologies for the pico cyanobacteria and also for all the diatom species aggregated together. If you want, you can ignore taxa altogether and you can produce biomass budgets based on size classes. Here I'm just showing the classic pico nano micro split, but we can choose any relevant groupings because we really can produce the whole size spectrum for the phytoplankton. Here at the bottom, I'm just showing the mean seasonal pattern in these data. And I just ask you to note that the red curve, the microplankton contribution peaks in the fall and winter in this system. With this, it turns out the seasonality dominates the variance when we look at the record of microplankton fraction in the full time series. We can learn more by removing that seasonal pattern. So this is now the anomaly record where I've taken out the average seasonal um, pattern. And now I'm plotting the times when microplankton contribution is higher than the average for that time of year in the red bars and when it's less than the average for that time of year as blue. For this decade where we have these observations, these results suggest, this anomaly time series suggests that there has been a multi-year trend toward increasing microplankton fraction in the phytoplankton at MBCO. Now, the, I, I know that went by quickly, and I imagine some of you are thinking, hmm, I don't know, maybe uh, she just, oh, how many instruments, how many deployments, how many calibrations, different algorithms, how, what statistics did she use? Maybe you're not convinced, and I'm totally with you. I know what's under the hood of all those deployments for 10 years, and 
all the idiosyncrasies of when the instrument was noisy and everything else. And so at three in the morning, I'm thinking, mm, you know, I don't know if I believe that either. But the, the, the really uh, powerful thing about the work we've been doing at MBCO is that we're not just using these new technologies. Whenever we get to the site, we collect water, we filter samples, and we do things like measure the uh, phytoplankton absorption spectrum which I don't have time to explain in detail, but we know from theory and a big body of empirical um, evidence is strongly linked to the cell size of the community. So here I'm showing just the anomaly ser series for a spectral flatness, which is an index for particle size. And here we see, again, an increasing trend. And if you like this kind of thing better, here's uh, size fractionated chlorophyll A. Um, greater than 10 micron fraction, and the anomaly series has also been increasing. So at, um, at this point, I can sleep on this because we have three independent measures that have completely different sampling frequency, different analytical approach, um, different sample volume, and they're all showing the same pattern. And now going forward with the LTR work, we want to be able to understand how these kinds of shifts in the phytoplankton are having impacts up through the rest of the ecosystem. So I just want to take a step aside for a second. It's a whole other topic, but I have to say that cobbling together this kind of, back, of background time series year after year has required as wide a range of funding sources as I could possibly muster, and I thank every single one of them who didn't really know they were part of this thing that emerged from putting it all together. And absolutely, these time series could only exist because of the dedication of a small but mighty team, um, my long-term colleague and wizard behind the instruments, Rob Olson, and Alexi Shalkiana, Taylor Crockford, Emily Peacock, and Joe Futrell are really the foundation. And then a steady flow of um, brilliant students who've led the way for bringing new insights from um, these data beyond just measuring the kinds of cells that are in the water. And I'll just highlight one example from the PhD work of Kristen Hunter-Severa. She worked on the Sinecococcus data set at first blush, that seasonal increase every year in the Sinecococcus looks very regular. But Kristen was able to show that there are actually systematic changes going on. In particular, over the first decade of the time series, spring was shifted about 20 days earlier in terms of warming in the system, and there was a correspondingly earlier Sinecococcus bloom during that period. Um, Kristen's work further was able to connect that this bloom advance was linked to Sinecococcus's physiological response where the division rates in the wild have this systematic relationship with temperature. So if it warms a little earlier in the spring, the Sinecococcus are able to divide sooner, outrun their grazers sooner, and the bloom gets kicked off earlier. Um, after the interesting talks that we heard on Tuesday, I, I decided to squeeze in another story so I could add my voice to the message about the importance of parasitism in the plankton. Um, this is about the dominant diatom at MBCO. After years of tracking this species, uh, Emily Peacock in my lab pieced together that these crazy looking images that we've been kind of glossing over for many years actually reflect various stages of parasite attack on this diatom. This turns out to be a eukaryotic parasite called Cryothecomonas. It's a circozoan. It's, uh, actually, it's a parasitoid because it's lethal to the host. And one of the interesting things is that we didn't figure out until many years into the time series that this was going on. But with the digital image archive, we were able to go back and, and um, un un uncover that this in kind of infection was recurrent in the time series. And we now think it's a, an important source of mortality for this uh, diatom. And incidentally, it appears to be quite specific, species specific. Um, in fact, we actually believe that the, the interaction with this parasite actually has a big influence on the seasonality of the blooms in this um, species and that, that it's coupled to the impact of the parasite. The largest blooms of the diatom occur during these cold winter periods when the, a parasite appears unable to infect the host. So it's not necessarily the best growth conditions for the diatom, but it's a, a refuge from this lethal um, parasite that uh, causes a high source of mortality. So I've been talking a lot about setting the stage with respect to the backdrop of phytoplankton data and knowledge that's emerging from studies at MBCO, but the LTR scope spans across the shelf and up the food chain. 
fortunately for us to set the stage for zooplankton, we're able to capitalize on multi-decade records that uh, reflect taxonomic composition and spatial distribution from NOAA's region-wide ecosystem monitoring programs. These are really rich data sets and they show things like systematic changes in the relative abundance of, in this case, small to large zooplankton. Um, interestingly, you might, this is a multi-decade going back to the 70s. You might note that the, um, there's been an increase in this index of small to large during the decade of change that I was just describing for phytoplankton at MBCO. So going forward with the LTR, we want to better understand the mechanisms that might be linking patterns such as these across trophic levels between phytoplankton and zooplankton. So at this point, you might be thinking, okay, that's really nice, but MBCO is one little spot in this dynamic system. How is that relevant to regional patterns of change in zooplankton and of the food web? To address this in the new project, we're, 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 we're going at this question by taking our automated cytometry and imaging cytometry uh, on the road, so to speak. So um, we're on, this is, these are results from our first winter transect cruise, so across that yellow section. Again, Sinecococcus, my favorite picoplankter. This is concentration measured every two minutes underway in flowing seawater um, during that cruise. And I just want to mention that even with just this one new data set, because we have the backdrop to set the stage, we can start to ask and answer some questions about the context for these observations from what we already know for over, from over a decade of study at MBCO. Here is the relationship between Sinecococcus concentration and temperature across that transect. Here's that relationship for the full MBCO multi-decade record, including the range of seasonality. And going forward, we want to be able to use these kinds of comparisons to extend our understanding of the underlying factors that we've uncovered at MBCO, regulate community structure, and how those may be leading to this possibly having commonalities across space and time in terms of leading to variance in the communities. Um, I'm not going to show you any results from the imaging that was done underway on those transects as well, but I'll just take this opportunity to invite you to visit the IFCB dashboard where you can now browse for the new NESLTR transect data set and you can see all the images from that cruise for yourself and other transects that we've already completed. The same system also serves the entire MBCO image data set both for browse, download, um, and it includes the products that we compute automatically. We're also beginning to populate the NESLTR broad scale data set. So this is for the region wide surveys with both new um, surveys and also earlier ECOMON surveys where we've been operating the IFCB um, automatically for underway sampling. And this is just an example from the 2014 survey showing a pattern of total diatom biomass computed the way that I explained earlier on a cell by cell basis. So now, with this kind of data coming out, I'm dreaming of the point where a decade from now, we know how and why diatom biomass is changing over this region. And we're starting to have hypotheses about the role those changes might play in patterns like these. This is from uh, NOAA's ongoing trawl surveys to help document things like shown here, the northward shift that's happening in some commercially important fish species. This is yellowtail flounder on the left uh, for the distribution for a decade starting in 1963 and on the right one starting in 2007 with the species is moving northward. So obviously these commercially important species, this, these pattern changes are really complicated. They depend not only on things that might be propagating up from um, the bottom of the food web, but also on behavior, on um, interactions with fishing pressure, so this, we know this will be a complicated problem. One way our, our NESLTR work will add an important aspect to meeting this kind of challenge of understanding across trophic levels is by focusing new effort on a suite of species of forage fish that depend quite directly on uh, zooplankton with fewer of these confounding factors. So Joel Yopis's group, uh, one of the co-PIs, is filling knowledge gaps in this area by studying uh, diet variability among these important species and both through, and through space and time. So this will give us important information not only about the immediate fate of plankton production, but also about this key pathway toward higher trophic levels. 
So uh, with that, I want to bring us back to our overarching questions in the new LTR project. We want to understand the factors that control patterns of composition and production in the plankton and how those in turn are impacting the feeding and distribution of fish. Ultimately, we want to contribute to understanding of the vulnerability and resilience of this ecosystem uh, to climate-induced environmental changes. This, we know, is a really big challenge that will have to be met by bringing together efforts across the region that extend well beyond the LTR activities. And uh, fortunately, there are many incredible efforts in this region, things like the multi-decade Narragansett Bay time series, Barney's amazing Nats transects, the Rutgers glider um, time series. So in terms of setting the stage, um, I think this LTR project is in great company. Um, and I hope that we can galvanize more collaboration in the region. Just a very small example of how some of this may be happening already. This is a timeline of LTR supported occupations of the focal transect uh, that have already taken place. And these, uh, this timeline shows the added transects that have been made possible by new partners. So other investigators in the region learned about the transect and have opportunistically occupied it to add to a community of observations to help us better understand how the system is changing and how it operates. So with that, um, I'm happy to introduce to you the whole group of uh, PIs on this project. I know I haven't done justice to the breadth of ideas and uh, approaches that they're bringing to the project. Several of them are here today. Please come talk to us um, about the project, learn more, give us your feedback, and um, bring us your ideas for collaboration. Thank you. Uh, hi, Seaver Wang, uh, Duke University. Um, on that map that you were showing of the LTER, I noticed two like dim yellow yellow transects, one going through the Mid-Atlantic Bight and another from like Cape Cod to the tip of Nova Scotia. Are those uh, significant? Are those pr uh, proposed future transects or something? No, I'm sorry. That map also reflected some existing other programs and assets that um, we ho hope to take advantage of in the big picture uh, the goals that we want to accomplish with the LTR. So those are um, other programs going on in the, in the region. <clears throat> Susanna Noya, Arizona State. Thank you for a beautiful overview of the time series. Um, I was wondering about Prochlorococcus, which is an interesting counterpart to Sinegococcus. Are you planning to incorporate, um, maybe using flow set, regular you know, standard yeah. flow cytometry, yeah, those that, populations? That's a great question. Um, generally speaking, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm ready to be found wrong, but generally speaking, Prochlorococcus doesn't, um, isn't found on the shelf, except I believe in the rare instances where there are relatively short-term intrusions of slope water into this, um, into this ecosystem. So we've looked pretty long and hard at, in the, at the MBCO data and they're not there. Um, this was, you know, that pattern of them not really being too predominant inside the Gulf Stream and not being on the shelf was documented back in the 90s, I guess. And um, we will be trying to make sure that when we get out to the edge of the shelf that we're not missing them. Um, as anybody who's tried to measure them with flow cytometry knows, you have to be very careful that your cytometer is sensitive enough to pick them all up. So we will be trying to do some of that. I didn't mention that there will also be um, a significant effort on sequencing as part of this project, both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So if we miss them in the cytometry, we'll find them there and then we can adjust our plans accordingly. We don't think they're that important in the system. Certainly in the slope water, they'll, they'll start to be there. Uh, great talk. This is Claire Reimers, Oregon State. Um, I'm not sure I captured the c connection to the Pioneer Array with the LTR program. Um, could, could you clarify that? Yeah. Um, so it's it, generally where the Pioneer Array will provide a lot of context for the physical conditions at the edge of the shelf, and especially 
through a wide range of, I'll say, sort of um, event scales of changes in invective and in, uh, processes at the edge of the shelf and interactions between the shelf water and the slope that we know are really dynamic and influenced by a wide range of processes that are difficult to capture in one, you know, sort of cruise uh, crossing of the frontal region. So in the in the big picture, when we integrate that wide range of observations with the modeling approaches, we're hoping to learn more about how nutrient processes are acting at the edge of the shelf, and then we'll connect that to the ecosystem characteristics that we'll be measuring as part of the LTR. The Pioneer Ray doesn't have the kinds of detailed measurements of plankton that we're able to do at MBCO. There are basic properties measured like chlorophyll fluorescence and oxygen and other biological and chemical related variables, but um, mostly it's from the physical point of view that we'll be able to incorporate that data. Thanks.